Hello and welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Framework Podcast. I'm one of your two hosts, Jamie, joined by Anna. Anna, great to see you again as always, my friend. Great to see you too, Jamie. Yeah, so uh, Anna, we're, we're joined by somebody I'm really happy to have on the show today, Aaron, a CEO of Vestwell. Aaron, it's good to see you again. I know that we, we had an announcement, so I got to see you a couple times out there. But uh, yeah, it's great to have you on the show here today. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Excited to be here. Always nice to see you and, and nice to see you, Anna. Nice to see you too, Aaron. Thanks for making time for us. Happy to. So uh, yeah, Anna's prepared great questions for you, but uh, we always start off with some of our fun ones and I'll probably deviate a little bit too. But uh, one of the first ones, Aaron, we always ask about people is, do you have a first money memory or at least one that comes to mind right away when we throw that out there? First money memory. Well, so I grew up uh, with a, you know, you know, blue collar, you know, lower middle class family. Um, so, you know, it was interesting. We never, I, we, but we never really felt anything about money. But my dad, so my dad was always very interested in the stock market, right? So he would invest in a couple little stocks and uh, he's, he was a carpenter. Um, and we'd always have dinner together as a family, um, which was great. And I now looking back, I'm like, wow, we did that every night. Um, but anyway, my dad would come home and he would talk about the stock market. Uh, and that's actually what kind of spawned my interest in kind of the financial ecosystem. So less like money centric, more just like, oh, this is kind of an interesting, you know, thing that I'm unfamiliar with and, you know, tell me more. Um, so, you know, he was definitely no financial guru by any means, but, um, but that was in, you know, that was early in my, in my life and, you know, really kind of by eighth grade, I had already made the decision that I wanted to do something in the financial sector. Um, so that's kind of what, what I tie back to like my, my first like real memory of the, of, of something like that. I was listening to a podcast you were on the other day and you said that in eighth grade, you wanted to be a stockbroker. So I was, I was curious about yep. your journey from, you know, you said very quickly, you realized that that's not what you wanted to do. So how did you get to, you know, CEO founder of Vestwell? Oh, so, well, so the, the, I was an intern at a, at a company called Everin Securities, um, in Chicago, um, it's actually part of the Wells Fargo these days. But anyway, um, I, they allowed me to go shadow uh, a stockbroker for a day. Mm -hmm. And I just watched the day to day like dial for dollars. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, this is this is not going to be the path I'm going to take. Um, so I ended up, um, but, but I was still interested in, in kind of oddly, right. It, it, there's still a lot of those things that I learned from, from that internship that are somewhat relevant today. Um, but the, the founding, you know, Vestwell or being a founder or co-founding Fully Dynamics actually was never something I had planned on doing. It was like the furthest thing from my mind. Uh, I went to grad school actually to kind of move to a different industry, um, and do more like strategic consulting and things like that. Um. And, but I, I always found this interesting, this space interesting. And the thing I found most interesting about it was problem solving, mm -hmm. right? And looking at like systemic flaws that you could see that were, you were just like, wow, that shouldn't be the case. And how do I change that? Mm -hmm. So actually that's what kind of drove me to do, to, you know, co-found Folio Dynamics, to, to found Vestwell, was looking at something like, this isn't right. There's a better way to do this, right? And and let me just kind of continue to peel back the layers. And I was that curious person. Um, actually, one of my grad school professors uh, told me he's like, he's like, you were the person that just asked why so many times to this point of annoyance, right? <laughs> Where you're just like, you're like, why would you do that? That doesn't make sense. Why? Why? Right? And then that's just kind of what's driven my career, right? And it wasn't it wasn't about founding something. It was I. Honestly, I still don't look at myself as an entrepreneur. I was just like a, a problem solver. Yeah. Well, how do you go from, that's a great, I love that. It's like you ask the why, but how do you go from asking the why and seeing the problem to then putting together a solution, right? Like, you know, there's a lot of people that can identify that there is an issue, but then the next step is a big one, right? Like going from, hey, something doesn't work to here is a solution for it. Yeah. Um, it's a big jump. Uh, I would say it is the thing, and especially the first time, right? The first time we did it, you know, I, I you know, I, it was a, a point in my life where it's probably a little easier, right? I didn't have kids. I didn't, you know, wasn't married. I, you know, there was, there was no one dependent on me, right? It was just me. So it's like, if I trip and fall, I, I could find a way to get up and a little easier. 
Um, and then, you know, a lot of it was just having conversations with people that I trusted their opinions and I, I value them. And I, I would, I would call people all the time and just be like, Hey, what if you had this, right? Or, or what, you know, what would, what would you like? What wouldn't you like? Right. All of those things. And so you just started to, to kind of like, just test the hypotheses around aspects. And then, and then you, then it, it went to the point of like putting pen to paper, and started drawing, drawing it up, right. And just working through all the, you know, every aspect of it from like pricing models to, to business operations, to legal, to whatever. And honestly, just trying to like cobble it together to a point and then finding that person who was willing to, to bet that this was the right move, understanding it would be painful. Right. I mean, trust me the the first few of our clients, you know, I'm, um, you know, both in, in the folio world and in the vegetable world, it's painful, right? It's hard because, you know, you know how complex this space is and there's mm -hmm. so much to build and it takes years, right? But you don't have years to start a business. Um, so, it, so it's a lot of just finding the right cadence and the right kind of baby steps to get there, knowing it's not going to be perfect. And then over time, you just get more mature with it and more comfortable with the uncomfortable. Um, and I think that was, that's what's been I think great with Vestal is like early days, especially I was much more comfortable with the uncomfortable aspects. And I was just like, I, I trust the team. I trust our aptitude. Like we'll figure this thing out. So you talked about also when you were interviewing client, um, job candidates that you would ask them why they wanted to work in retirement. So I was curious first one, why did you ask that question? And two, what is your answer to that question? So, <clears throat> I'm always curious, right, to ask why. Um, of course. <laughs> and, and you know, this is a this is not an industry where you look at from the outside and that is appealing in many ways, right? Like, there's so many things people you know go after, or try to build, or they work at certain companies that are, you know, have much more of an allure, right, from mm -hmm. from the outside. And this, I'm like, why do you want to be in retirement? Like, this is boring. Right. Like, like you're literally playing a game, you know, you're, you're helping people play a, the long game, right. For, for many, many years. Um, and I thought, you know, their responses were interesting, right. Because you, you kind of start to figure out who's really in it versus like someone else is just a, a stop off point in their career. Um, so that was kind of the, the overall you know reasoning behind the question. And I think the, the answer and the answer for myself, right. Um, was really around solving a problem for people mm -hmm. that need it most, right? Mm -hmm. And I always, I, like, I just have this, you know, just underlying kind of, you know, I, I drive to say, listen, if we're not helping, you know, our, 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 you know, communities, our friends, our families, or whatnot, our kids to, you know, end up in a better place than which they started, we're not doing our job. Right. It's not about like, you know, the, the unimportant aspects of life that, you know, people use for, you know, like I'll, I'll pick on like Instagram, right. Or whatnot. Like I don't have Instagram. Like I don't use Instagram because Frank, frankly, and I know a lot of people do, and there's certain reasons why they do. And that's great, but I find it a massive waste of time. Right. I'm like, we have such a little bit of time on this planet. Right. And I feel like I, there's so many things we could do to help solve those things. Like why not try to do it? So the, the folks that I found, and this is kind of culturally what's created in our in our own business at Festival, is the team is a the really hard problem solvers. They love the problem, they love the challenge, and they love the impact that it has. Right? It's a real impact of people's lives that I think is important. Like, are we saving lives? No. Right? Um, you know, my wife saves lives. Right? And I, I joke, I'm, I'm like, I'm like, you make them live longer, I'll make sure they can afford it. Right. And, and like, that's kind of like, like our little, like, like joke, right. Internally, but it's real. It's like, Hey, these are, these are real aspects that are important to people and we have to help. Yeah. But I, I, I actually sometimes push back against that. Cause I'm like, what we do know though, is people with financial stability, right. Are like, they live much healthier lives, right? Like they, you know, they actually live longer. They're not as stressed. They don't drop out of the workforce. They can survive, you know, financial calamities and pay for healthcare and all those things. And so like, it's actually like to even afford the doctors and the people that save their lives, they actually need to take care of this, right? Like that's been a historical challenge. So it's actually like a, 
I, I think it's actually even more noble than sometimes we give this, you know, financial world credit for because without it, we don't get to any of those next things, right? That and that's, uh, you know, m maybe an issue also for our country more broadly, but it's not just our country. I mean, that's uh, something that impacts the whole world, and no matter where you sit, that tends to still be the case. Yeah, no, I I totally agree with you. I think you know as much as you kind of want to be like, oh yeah, we could just live, you know healthy, happy lives, you know, the financial aspect of that plays yeah. very much into the healthy, happy aspect. Um, you know, whether you want to admit it or not, but it is, it is yeah. largely true. What's the worst answer you got that you've ever gotten? I mean, maybe to that question or any interview question, I'd love to oh, wow. Did you ever just get something you were like, well, this is clearly done. <laughs> <laughs> You're yeah. clearly not hired. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, there's, there's plenty of those. I'm trying to think of a specific example. Yeah. I, I kind of blocked those out of my mind. Um, <laughs> but, I don't waste your brain space on that stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a, um, but I mean, there's some people where you just look at where they're just, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. So what? And this is not like too specific, but when people don't want to anchor on an answer and they'll just kind of dance around it. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, just, just give me an answer. Right. Like anything. What is it? I don't care what it is. Like I need a job. Right. That could be a fine answer. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, but you know, when people are like, look grasping for some, yeah. you know, super insightful answer, you're like, it's okay. Like you may not have thought about it. You guys pay money for work. I'm willing to work for money. <laughs> I like to eat food. I want to buy some food. <laughs> yeah. One, one interesting thing in, in uh, our CTO, uh, well, our, our CTO we had when we started the business, he retired. Um, but we, the other CTO, they've, they've known each other for years and worked together. But um, our current CTO as well, they always ask people when they start in front of everyone, um, what is your favorite vegetable and why? Mm -hmm. And it's it's kind of interesting. When, and then you can map it back to certain characteristics. And it's, and it's kind of just puts people on the spot. It's just very, it's just like the random oddball thing that gets thrown at people. Um, and I always appreciate just listening to the responses because people are caught off guard and they're like, huh? So, okay. Yeah. yeah. I don't think that mine's my fave, but the first one that came to mind was Brussels sprouts. Mm -hmm. And it's one that I, I learned to like later on. And I found them to be much more, uh, I guess... You, like they're they're kind of you can do more things with them than I thought you could was part of it right like I I used to just think of Brussels sprouts as like the one that my parents would make that were like boiled and awful and then yes. you learn like you can roast them you can chop them you can make raw Brussels sprout salads you can turn them into like you know bacon and stuff things with them like like they have they're really like they have a wide usage but that's the first came to my mind because that's the one that probably changed the most for me, right? Like green beans and stuff like they've all they've always been fine. But that one went from like disgusting to like super you know versatile as a food item that now my kids eat, my wife eat, like we all eat them, but we hated them. The right. rebrand was amazing. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I I totally agree with you. Like that changed, like it would show up on menus at restaurants. Yeah. Like, oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's like white, yes, you know, like white truffle bacon, you know, <laughs> truffle sprouts. And you were just like, no, you just boil those things. And they get kind of like weird water. They still in the bottom of the bowl and like nobody wants them. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, that was the same I had growing up. Yes, I totally agree. That's a great. I think Anna, zucchini what's... Would, be, would be mine. Okay. I like a zucchini kind of got not not as tremendous a rebrand as brussels sprouts over my <laughs> life but like i like to use it to make like zoodles and i use it to make a bunch of different things so i like zucchini you can make it bread and make it sweet yeah. make it savory it's it's a whole thing yeah i, li I like the versatility of zucchini my <laughs> mine would have to be broccoli though i i i because i raw cooked you can you know yeah come up with a bunch of iterations of it um i, I would still go with the broccoli aspect is there so, like bro there's probably is is there like broccoli bread now like cauliflower has also had a, a return to fame right because now you get like cauliflower pizzas and bread and all types of stuff so it's it's become super you know and trying to make I it like buffalo chicken I just, yeah i, I see I the sprout aspect like the broccoli sprout bread yeah yeah. I saw this well, meme once that was like, we're expecting entirely too much of cauliflower these days. <laughs> <laughs> the bar's been raised, huh? Yeah. 
Well, I, I, I love that. So of expecting too much, you know, what should the world be expecting of Vestwell now, right? Because, you know, <laughs> here you are, right? You're, you're storming into an industry that got a little stagnant on the way to, you know, serve people in the retirement plan space. You said, hey, we're going to do it better and different. And so, you know, tell, tell us a little bit about what you're focused on right now and how you think that Vestwell is differentiating in this market. And obviously Carson partnered with you for our small plan solution and we got plans rolling in there and, you know, which is great to have partnered. And, uh, but yeah, tell me a little bit of and people who are listening that don't know who, what Vestwell is and what you're doing. I think it's is a opportunity for them to hear. Yeah. I mean, you know, you know, by and large, um, you know, our mission is really to provide all businesses and savers with the opportunity to save in the most meaningful way possible for them. Right. Um, and starting in the workplace and then doing it on an individual basis and like tax preferred, right. Not, not on the well side. So, um, super excited to, to work with you, Jamie and the Carson team. I, mean, I think back to our conversations way back when, and, um, and kind of, you know, talking about what, what we could do together. Um, and it's nice to kind of see it come to life here, but, um, you know, what we're doing, right. Is we're, Think of us as the engine inside, right? Powering 401ks, 403bs, IRAs, payroll directed or, or, or just direct kind of IRAs, um, uh, uh, 529 college savings, uh, and then ABLE uh, program savings. Um, and then, you know, what you expect and where we're going, right, is, is expanding those savings opportunities. So we're going to roll out an emergency savings program um, later this year. And then after that, we're going to do a health savings uh, program. And, and what we, our job, right, as Vestwell is to provide the underlying infrastructure and architecture to power these programs at a high level of efficiency and scale with the opportunities for, you know, like Jamie's advisor team to engage with the, the employers and the employees at, at high scale, um, but provide real insight behind it and, and how to do that versus just saying, you know, putting something on the shelf, you know, having it, you know, have, you know, l I guess, you know, less, uh, I don't know, it, well, investment products are maybe overly expensive or not the right fit or just kind of there to offset the cost of the technology. And we look at it and say, well, if we're building the technology right, there should not be a need to offset that, right? And that mm -hmm. technology can be, can be at a price point that is, you know, cheaper or more cost effective than anything else in the market because it's built in the right framework. So we don't need to kind of look at other ways to compensate um, the business or the, or the partners in doing so. And that's really kind of near and dear to like how we think about the core philosophy of what we're building. And it gets down to really nuanced aspects of the space. Um, so we just dissect every aspect along the way and try to look for opportunities to make it really easy with the ultimate goal of, hey, get everyone engaged in savings, right? And every advisor should be able to, you know, with confidence show up to, you know, an existing client or a prospective client that's a business owner and say, hey, I can give you our, you know, workplace savings program. And it could be a 401k, it could be an IRA, it could be whatever. and and you can give this to all of your employees, right? And it can be done in a really uh, elegant, insightful way and get people saving early, right? Because ultimately we have to get people saving now if they're gonna you know, be secure in their financial future down the road. Um, so that's kind of what we're always thinking about and, and doing. And then there's things along the way, right? That we got to, you know, we, we put together um, personalized investing and, and these managed account solutions, which we use as the building blocks and the framework for goals-based investing, right? To, to start thinking about what else can we incorporate along the way. So as an individual saver, I can log in, I could say, hey, I need personalized investing. I'm gonna, you know, that gets pulled together based on who they are and the, the, and the factors you put into the, to the model. Um, and then we'll start thinking about, okay, could we put an emergency savings alongside this, right? Or, you know, do they have children that, you know, want to go to college? So we put a college savings program in place, right? And you start to kind of bring all of these worlds together and take the burden off the individual of having to go seek those out for themselves. Um, and, and that's kind of where we're always uh, focused around and what we're building toward. Is there anything out of the, I, mean, I know, obviously, the first SECURE Act, you guys uh, were able to kind of 
you know, deal with a lot of the changes there. Well, is there anything in this this new one um, that you either view as a big opportunity for the space or a concern? So I think they're all opportunities, can, candidly. Like, I think I, I'm, we're super excited about it all. I mean, we're not in the position of a lot of other you know, record keeping providers. Um, I know a lot of them have been kind of stomping their feet and, and pushing back and saying, that's impossible. How could you, you know, put that burden on us and blah, blah, blah. And I'm talking to a bunch of folks in the space and some of the fo- uh, people that, that uh, crafted the language in it. And I'm like, no, it's all very doable, right? There's 77 provisions. They're all, you know, we can do, I think all but less than a handful today. Um, and we're, we're actively going to build those and have those ready, you know, by the time they, they uh, go live, either, you know, end of this year or whatnot. Um, but there's things in there that I think are great opportunities. Like I think the, the part-time worker aspect mm-hmm. um, and getting them enrolled is great. Uh, now, the traditional folks, I think, are going to have a hard time with that because the eligibility requirements can be difficult. Um, now, we've, we've built a patent pending eligibility calculation engine around things like that. Uh, to handle these kind of nuanced aspects, you know, because when you're doing hours based eligibility or, or whatnot, it can get complicated quickly, especially if you're you're thinking about like a restaurant employee or a high turnover type business. Um, those things can be uh, difficult to, to make sure they're streamlined. So I think but it's a great opportunity to get people saving. Um, I think, you know, um, th- there's a lot of other provisions in there that I think are, are great. But by and large, it moves it makes it easier for people to get a savings program in place. Um, You know, the IRA side, it's it's like starter K they call it, but it's really an IRA. Like, is it going to, you know, be the game changer for the industry? No, but it's nice that they can do that. Right. And have that. So I, that's, you know, as with all legislation, I always look at it as an iterative process. Like they're never going to get it right day one. Right. But if you can build on it, great. No, I love that. Yeah, the 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 starter four hundred one k was just like that's an an employer IRA, right? <laughs> like, yeah. you look at that, you're like, yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah, it's all it is, right? It has the same provisions. <laughs> um, but again, it's just this is. I look at this as like just the foundation. Like, yep. get you know, get get this in place. Okay, build on it, iterate, see what's working, what's not working, and then we can turn the dials along the way. So, Aaron, earlier when you were talking, you called. Um you said savers instead of participants. And so that's pretty interesting. Talk to us about why it's important to make that distinction, um, calling people savers versus participants. And and I, my team hears me complain about this enough, right? Because it's, you know, we're always like, as an industry, we're always like, oh, you know, you know, sponsors, participants, whatnot. But it like dehumanizes and, and, you know, disengages and, and, and people don't think like, we don't think about sponsors, right? In our lives, we don't think about participants, right? You're just like, okay, there's businesses, there's employers, right? And there's, and there's people, they're savers. And, you know, in our world, they're savers, right? Because you want people to save. We even started getting away from the investing side of it, right? Because uh, it used to be like savers and, you know, saving and investing. And we started actually thinking about it. It's really just saving, right? You're investing as part of that savings vehicle, but it is just saving. So um, I think it's, it's, you know, ultimately, right, a risk is put in place for people, right, for savers. So it's like, hey, how do we start to get people aligned on that? You know, just as like we use too many acronyms, like all these, like even 401k, right? It's a tax code, right? Or like, like we do such a bad job naming things, right? <laughs> so, so, you know, and, and, and I get why we do because we're all, you know, kind of in our world and it makes sense to all of us in the industry. But once you step outside <laughs> and you want people to actually engage, we have to rethink how you're communicating. Yeah. Well, at least like most of the country can name one ERISA provision, right? Like this, we, we, we have one thing that's a positive. <laughs> that is true. That is true. Most people do know, right? It only took uh, how many decades, but yeah, <laughs> most people do know. Yeah, you know, it's like what <laughs> late 1970s would be 401k because it wasn't part of the original, right? Like it was an ad, I think a year or two later, something like that. Right. So, yeah. Are y'all friends fans at all? The show, the TV show? Oh, I, I mean, I, I've i seen many episodes in my life. Yeah. There was an episode with where Phoebe gets a job at one of those corporate massage places and she's like, I get benefits in a 401k. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
I don't know. That just came, that popped in my mind. <laughs> oh, Maybe that might catch on. <laughs> or you think like even like I, I was thinking like HSA, right? And and health savings, right? I mean, everyone confuses it with an FSA. Yep. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's like those those little things. Like I think we just have to do a better job. Even managed accounts, right? And and um actually Kevin Murphy over at Franklin uh, just published an article and, and we were I saw him uh, last week or two weeks ago. We were catching up and he was talking about like how just managed accounts is just a bad name, right? And it was like, and I'm like, yeah, it is, right? And, and to us, it makes sense. And I grew up in a managed account world and uh, mm-hmm. it's second nature to me. But but yeah, I was like, managed accounts don't make sense, right, to people. Uh, so it's just, I, I think we just have to you know push each other a little bit. Yeah, there's a lot of that. I mean, we would just joke about when people came in, like, right, that, you know, you have an RIA that manages an IRA and it's just like, yeah, I don't know what that is. And then you're a registered <laughs> rep of the RIA. So you're an IAR of an RIA that manages an IRA, right? And you're like, okay, nope. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's true, man. The acronyms we throw around, it's amazing. Yeah. It's, uh, and like some of that takes a while, even for like professionals to, to land on. Um, yeah, it's a, It's tough, but I mean, a lot of that comes from the legal world, right? And we don't really get general adopted other terms. So then the only way to make sure that we're actually being consistent on the language is to go back to the original guiding legal structure, which is awful for end, you know, regular day people to then comprehend, right? So, yeah, uh, I had, uh, I had lunch, this is going back several years with uh, one of the former uh, commissioners of the SEC and it, it was a really fun, interesting lunch. Um, but he started, he's like, I just walked out of a two hour meeting of whether, you know, whether or not advisors should be spelled with an O or an E. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it was like that. And he's like, he's like, this is horrible. He's like, what are we doing? Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's, you know, you get compliance departments that change that too. And, saw somebody posting about i think it was samantha about how like the some broker dealer banned the use of the dollar sign in any advertisements because they said it was promissory and it was like so that makes that makes it a little hard to talk about money <laughs> like <it's- laughs> spell it out that's a whole lot of time wasted <laughs> $45,000. All right. (laughs) Glad we cleared that one up. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. Uh, So so you were mentioning that the meeting at the SEC, I don't know what popped in my head. Somebody asked me this recently, but who's somebody in the industry, either historical or present that you would love a conversation with that you either, or maybe it's outside the industry, but a leader that you might've looked up to and said, that would be a cool conversation to have. Um, well, what I, I've had, uh, some interesting dialogues that are very much like to be continued with, uh, secretary Ali Kaur, uh, the department of labor. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he's a very interesting person. He's got some, you know, I think unique insights that we don't necessarily see, right. They're engaged with a lot of conversations, um, that we don't have, but, uh, you know, I, I, I think just sitting down with folks like that um, and trying to understand why, right? Uh, like, why are they thinking certain ways? Like, what what's the driver behind it? Um, I think that's someone I, I would I would definitely uh, like to like to sit down with it in a more kind of um, you know longer dialogue. Um, I don't. I mean, there's a lot of folks. I, I actually I've gone down to Capitol Hill a few times, right, and met with um, you know senators and congressmen and women, um, primarily like the banking, finance, tech Mm -hmm. committees. Um, And it's, I've always, I've walked away like so uh, just kind of wowed by, I think the depth that they understand things. I think Mm -hmm. oftentimes you just kind of bucket, you know, Capitol Hill, you're like, oh, what those guys don't know. But they actually know a lot and like how they're trying to move the ball forward. and it's been it's it, it gave me a lot of like personal insight of like okay where are the things that are actually doable today uh, versus just theoretical or you know pie in the sky dreams uh, and just trying to like chip away at those things. So I always I I would love to sit down with you know anyone in that that regard you know, on either side of the aisle and just have those those conversations, which is I think are super enlightening. Yeah, I think people are 
often surprised when they get to spend time with a lot of them like how smart they are and also like quick witted too, which was like, I I started off in political consulting and I don't know that I had the best view of politicians going in. I don't today either, but what I was super surprised on was that like one, how knowledgeable they typically were on a broad arrangement of things. And like, also a lot of them were like super quick witted and because like people are constantly coming up to them, right? Like just constant, like they're, you know, constituents, people from back home. And, you know, they're always like, oh, you're from that town. And like, whatever the Panthers are your mascot and blah, blah. Like they know all these like random things too, which I thought was like interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. I mean, you, it is true. And I think, I think that the breadth by which they have to cover topics, mm-hmm. it, like you said, is uh, it's astonishing. Right. And they have to know a lot. <clears throat> I, I do remember I got to spend and have a conversation with, uh, well, he was former then, but um, the speaker, uh, John Boehner. And one thing he did tell me, though, he was like, I remember this super because this is our space, but he was like, the people who knew Arissa super well, he was like, at the end of my time, most of them were gone. He was like, there were only a handful of us left that really like dove into it, knew it. He was pretty heavy into the Pension Protection Act bill. And like, that was a concern of his, at least like in the mid, you know, like two years, probably 2015 or something. He was like, that group is kind of going away. The ones that were part of social security reform, part of the tax reform and part of ERISA is like, even the ones that like clerked and worked in these offices are kind of like aging out. And I just remember he had that conversation that like, he was a little bit concerned about that. Um, but I think they actually showed a lot of wherewithal in the last two bills of secure act, which probably retrained a whole new group of people on ERISA and, you know, kind of the regulations down there. So that that's probably a, yeah. that's like an odd <laughs> side benefit because like you have this whole group of staffers that will now have that experience and knowledge for the next 20, 30 years again. No, true. Very true. It's, it's, um, and I feel like we're, we're fortunate in many ways, like as an industry, because we kind of deal with the one aspect that's completely bipartisan. Right. <laughs> when you when you when you talk to anyone, they're like, it doesn't matter who it is. Like, there's not. There, everyone's just like, okay. Like, there, there's little you know dials you got to turn within there. But it, by and large, people are like, yeah, okay, we got to fix this. Yeah. Well, Aaron, we want to be respectful of your time. We know you have a lot to do. So as we wind down, we always like to ask about um, your freedom and what what finding your freedom means to you. Finding my freedom. Oh. Depends super on how philosophical. You define freedom. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I feel like every minute of my life is occupied. Um, <laughs> Jamie gets uh, that. <laughs> you know, I honestly like my wife and I were talking about this uh, recently. We were kind of sitting now, like, well, what do we what what are we going to do with our lives? Like, you know, future state, whatever. Um, and I think part of it, like my freedom and what I. Uh, want to find more of is the time to just like pull my head up uh, and catch my breath a little bit. Um, I feel like, and partly it goes back to the point I made where like we only have, we have such limited time here, right? And you're just trying to do so much. And that that's, you know, a lot of this is self-inflicted, um, but it's like just being able to pull back for a second and say, okay, let me just breathe. Let me think this through um, and do that, you know, so you spend more time with my kids, my family, those, that, that's like how I think about like the freedom of, of, uh, just headspace. I was talking to, um, actually chair of my board recently. And I was like, I was like, the one thing I want this year is like, I want more headspace, right. Just to think about things. Cause I feel like we, we, we're in such a pivotal moment. Like I think as a business as best, well, like things have never been more exciting. Like I I'm, I'm like loving this. I finally feel like, like, this is the most fun I've had right at, at, at festival and building this, so, you know, you could look back and reminisce about certain aspects, but like, I feel like now the momentum is just flying. Right. And, and we've done the hard stuff and we're there and it's like, and then it's like pulling your head up and say, okay, we're going to start flying downhill right now. Let's make sure we're on the exact right course. We want to be right as a business. Um, and just do doing the right things for everyone. So, so that's, that's kind of how I think about freedom, I guess, in that regard. Just a good answer. So, well, Aaron, thanks for partnering with us. Thanks for everything you're doing with Vestwell. Thanks for coming on today. I like our new vegetable question too. We can go around and ask the world. I think we'll incorporate that. (laughs) 
That's and great. That's great. Well, no, I appreciate it. It was great to see you guys. Uh, fun to spend time and, and yeah, grateful for the partnership. Yeah. And Anna, thanks for uh, leading us through again here today. And thank you, everyone else, for watching this episode of the Framework Podcast. Make sure you subscribe so you never miss an episode. Thank you.